Hide as a python. Welcome to another edition of the pull-up series. I'm here with my main man Shane from Small Town Exotics. It is great to be here, man. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. You got a great facility, man. It's larger than life in here. Animals are awesome. You guys, if you guys haven't seen that video yet, it'll be in the description down below and check up right now on this link. Um, so yeah, man. Uh, a lot of people who don't know you, so just tell them about yourself, how you got started, and you know what brought you to this dope place right here. All right, so uh, like Antoine said, my name's Shane, Small Town Exotics. Uh, when I was uh, late teens and early 20s, I, I was one of those keepers that had like one of everything. I had like an albino berm, red tail, leopard gecko, all that. And then uh, I went through some life changes, got rid of all my animals. And then last April, or 2019 April, I seen a genetic strike ball python. And I always wanted one of those from, from years ago, but they were real expensive back then. So I bought her. And fast forward to it today, I mean, a little over a year later, and this is what happened. So, so how many do you think you have right now? So oh, I, I have uh, I have about 70 snakes right now. Nice. From 1 to 70 in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it gets like that, huh? I, I went from 1 to, I think, 40 in like three months. And man, there were some problems with that. Like, I had snake shit from all over. I had mites everywhere. I mean, it was... So I learned a lot real quick in my first year about mites, quarantining, all kinds of stuff. So did you have a couple of guys early on that, um, like, that you followed online that kind of put you in the right direction as far as... Or you just kind of got stuff here and there without really a plan off the jump? So, uh... We kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, I started out just listening to bullshit from uh, Sean Bradley. I was already listening to podcasts like True Crime and stuff when I was at work, so uh, I, I jumped on that, and then that eventually led me to YouTube, which of course, like Miguel at Always Evolving Pythons, uh, Dead Mouse, and Justin, uh, yeah, it just progressed from there. Oh, Garrick DeMeyer, man, I gotta give you, I mean, that guy's the, the business, man. <laughs> yeah, I still, still got a pie from him from like 10 years ago, so... Shout out to Garrett DeMeyer, even though you don't answer your other phone number anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, that so guy has a know. great series if you go into his channel and, like, he explains morphs and stuff. And that's where I started, uh, like, learning, you know, recessives, codoms, all that. Yeah, just Garrett. like with uh, Justin and stuff, too. He had, like, the Morph 101 series, like, mm -hmm. back in the day, too. So I've been on all of that stuff and all of his old, like, care sheets and breeding tips. He had, like, a seven-part breeding tip series. Remember that from yeah. back in the day? Yeah, he needs to go back and redo that, uh, like kind of like an updated version of all that stuff too. A lot of the information is still pretty much the same, and a lot of people follow that. But there's some little nuances in there too that he can add to it that he's been kind of putting out there. So I think that'd be cool for the people who don't follow him on like a lot of those podcasts because he gives away a lot of jewels on a lot of podcasts too. Man, it's crazy if you catch little tiny stuff like that, like. Um, morphs to look out for, stuff that's being slept on. So <laughs> whenever so whenever you guys listen to a podcast with a big breeder and someone asks them about like morphs that's being slept on or stuff to look out for, that means it's in their project and they're about to drop the bomb. So yeah. listen <laughs> listen early on a lot of those projects man and, and see. So um so this is your first breeding season or second or what season is this? This, this is my very first. And how many clutches you got down right now on the ground? Uh, well, we've we've cut two, and uh, we have two in the incubator, and I got four girls that are getting ready to lay. Nice, man. So, um, how many eggs now? Probably about 30 eggs close to or something there, or a little bit more than that? My first two clutches were 10 apiece. <laughs> Crazy. And then I got a clutch of seven, then I got a clutch of 11 in here, so uh, I've been having big numbers. People ask me how I do it. I don't know, man. I feed frozen thaws and then I keep them in this room. That's all I know. <laughs> That's good, man. Like you can get like so. You're going to put the the babies are frozen off the jump too, or um, I start them off alive. I start them off with the the mice hoppers, and mm -hmm. then after the first couple, I transition them over. Mm -hmm. That's how I've been doing it. That's crazy. Yeah, I start off the jump with um. So I do fuzzies off offer it. I'll try those out, and if they don't, I'll downgrade the ones I'm keeping. I downgrade those to ASFs since I may or may not have ASFs. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it'd be good to kind of get them started, whatever, we'll kind of go between that and mouse hoppers. 
and a lot of people go, oh man, a lot of snakes you give you no know, ASFs to, it's like a death sentence, and that's all they'll ever eat, and that's not true. You mix it up early, they can kind of eat whatever, you know, so, but then stuff that I'm not holding back, I'll plan on selling, especially a lot of times, I'll have stuff like pip on the egg, and it'll be paid for, or deposited, like, off the jump, so I'll hit them up, and I'll say, hey, you know, what do you feed? You have access to mice or ASFs too, and I kind of adjust that way, so, that's kind of no cool seller tip I learned where um, right off the jump, I pretty much do whatever's convenient for what the person that's already paid for, you know. It's like um, I got I got a freeway sitting in tubs right now that's been paid for for a couple of weeks now, but it's 108 degrees outside and I don't want to, you know, the insurance is down right now for stuff too. So shout out to Rashad from 212. <laughs> so he's he's like, man, my freeway better be a breeder by the time I get <laughs> So man, yeah. So, um, question I ask everybody: What's your um, tub setup? How do you set up your um, your your tub, your egg box? Do you use like vermiculite, a mixture, perlite, hatchrite? I do uh, perlite, mm -hmm. and I put I don't know inch and a half down in. A, I use the six quart iris tubs, and I use easy hatch trays. I pour the water to just below the perlite and set it. Forget it. <laughs> People are still killing me about not using easy hatch trays or whatever. Yeah. So I went to Home Depot and bought the whole little thing of like the light diffuser you have to cut up or whatever. And I didn't even know what an easy hatch tray was. No one was going to be pushing them. I bought like, I think maybe two full sheets. And then the very next day, the easy hatch trays came out. <laughs> and I was like, no, not doing it. And I was like, if I get to the point where all these diffusers are done and I need more space, I'll buy your freaking easy hatch tray. <laughs> but this is just me being petty, petty and stubborn. Man, oh man. <laughs> There's no way, man. Like I was just so mad. I was like, man, this is such a good idea. Like that's something like I should have thought of as a breeder and having issues like that too. So, and what's so crazy about our hobby? is that um there's so much room for innovation you know you got like the um the sifter for the cocoa blocks over there you know yeah. what i mean so that's that's a crazy idea and um is that like an fb90 tub under there or is that like a special one just for uh no just you got it it's an fb90 mm -hmm. and then it sifts and it's a job car and mm -hmm. it's a little like a tote yeah i mean it's it's a multifunctional piece of equipment yeah, just kind of things like that that make your life easier. Like, I'm actually coming up with a new idea for a rack now where for each individual level, you can adjust the ventilation per level with just like a turn of a lever or a knob. So that way, if you got a certain different size in your tub, so you have like a free real one there where you have small ones in there just kind of growing up and some of the bigger ones need different amounts of ventilation for humidity. So I'm actually coming up with something now where I can adjust that at the bottom and, you know, but if somebody want to take that idea, hey, that's free game, I'll buy it from you. <laughs> that I got so much stuff going on right now, I don't have time to be in the garage tinkering and inventing, but if in a year from now this, no, no one's coming up with that idea, hey, I'm down, that might be something I can, you know, pitch the Freedom Breeder when I go visit them in a couple of months. Yeah, because, you know, you know I have certain levels where the humidity goes mm -hmm. out quicker. Like, yep. the ones higher up dry out a lot quicker than the ones down lower, and that would be handy. Which ventilation do you have on? Is it 25% of I, I use 25. Yeah. Because, so. because I'm in Bakersfield and I'm running a, a mini split, mm -hmm. which automatically dehumidifies everything. Like, that's my biggest battle here is yep. humid humidity. Yeah, so this was was so this was just one big garage, and then you put a wall and blocked it off, or yeah, that's that's so crazy, man. So yeah, so the front is still like an actual garage for my mm -hmm. tools, and then this back half's connected to my house, so the snakes are out of the house, but they're still connected to my house, and and made everyone happy. My wife made me happy. You know, Got to keep the wife happy. Tip number one. Yeah. <laughs> what does the room stay at in here? Uh, it, it, that that mini split will let it fluctuate. It'll stay. I set it at eighty, mm -hmm. and then uh, it'll be between like seventy eight and eighty two. And you use heat on all your racks, so you don't do like. Um, so obviously, if it's eighty, you have to have like heat on. What you set your hot spots to? I set the bottom of the tub at ninety. Mm -hmm. So then, if if they burrow down, it's not mm -hmm. too hot for them. And a lot of them are cool sitting on top of the the substrate. Yeah. And, and then and on top of the substrate, it'll be about eighty eight if I set the tub at ninety. And then for substrate, you use. Cocoa Blocks, baby. Yeah. Woo -woo. And he's a distributor, so if you're in the area, hit him up. All his information will be in the description down below, so you can hit him up and uh, get your Cocoa Block on, you know. So I'm team with Raptor Chip over here, so, but, <laughs> but, 
Hey, we don't draw lines <laughs> in the sand, and nope. we, we don't so, participate in block wars. That's yeah, the retards. So, yeah, so this isn't like, you know, team like Xbox and PlayStation. Oh, this, they're all stupid, you know, because a lot of times, you know, people will have their favorite block they use, and they'll use like Pro Coco or some of the other brands. And if never even touched any other thing, it can't even speak on it. So I like the fact that, man, I'll use them all, you know. So if I had a small collection, you know, if I had under 20 snakes, I'd probably be still on paper. Because to me, that makes life a lot easier. But when you have so many snakes and you spot cleaning all the time, stuff to definitely go with a good uh, coconut bedding. So I'm going to take some of this cocoa block home today. And then um, I'll do a comparison and, you know, see, you know, what the good and bad is for both of them, man, you know. And, um. I'm down for that. So, and then you said, so you said you, you feed frozen thaw most of your stuff, and uh, yeah, about ninety five percent of my collection is frozen thawed. I do have some of the stubborn ones that I bought like as older that only went on live, and they stay on live. So, I get about a dozen live a week from a local guy. So, you know, all of us coming up now, we have a couple of group of guys that we call to help identify stuff that we look up to for advice. Who are your go to guys right now that? That probably rolled their eyes when the phone turned and your name up. <laughs> so, uh, well, first and foremost, I go to the Four Horsemen. That's like a little YouTube group I'm in. It's uh, Predator BP from England, uh, Raw Bear Claw in Malaysia, and uh, BBM Reptiles over in Puerto Rico. So I ask those three. I'm in a group chat. I talk to those guys every day. I kind of get their opinions because they're all different levels. And uh, then I, I usually ask the breeder that I got the parents from mm -hmm. for assistance. And that's kind of the direction I go. Nice, dude. I'm, and all my stuff's from higher up breeders, so I trust their judgment. Yeah, dude. I'm in like I can't tell you how many Instagram and Facebook groups I'm in, yeah. and telephone group chats. It's just it's just so crazy, man. Like sometimes I'm at the point where I'm just I'm we're talking about like the same stuff because some video just came out, and I'm like, hey, did you see this? They're like, hey, dummy, you posted that yesterday. I'm like, oh, my bad. Okay, yeah. it's a different right. it's a yeah. different group chat, but you know it's. The difference between now, with um, especially with our industry with, with ball pythons and our hobby, compared to 10, 12 years ago, to me it was like how I don't know if you listen to Joe uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. He talks about how set up comedy was before he came to the comedy store, where it seems like everybody back then was like against each other. There was no one like trying to give game to each other. There was nobody trying to help elevate the other person. And now it's like everybody does collaborations. Everybody helps each other out. Everyone pushes each other because somewhere along the line, people realize that like if I help you out or you help me out, it helps the hobby out. Which in turn helps the industry out. Yeah. So we all eat. So there were back in the days, dude. Man, you miss all the good stuff. You miss when people would like get out of the get out of the hobby, sell a collection, and then have like single gene and double gene and maybe three gene codom adult females and just slap the word head on it. Where now yeah. you just paid three thousand dollars for heads and stuff. So I know people are getting tired of me telling this story, but in two thousand twelve, I bought. Two breeders, whatever, because a uh, guy I worked with, he had ball pythons, and um, he was moving to Texas to sell a lot of stuff. He sold me what was supposed to be a visual clown, uh, no, a visual pie, 100% head clown, and then a female double head hypo clown. All right. 36 eggs, never a visual clown. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. So three or four seasons... Yeah, so I paid three thousand dollars for a single gene pie male and then a normal female probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so and I can't wait till I see him again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so I, I do. I forgot to mention someone earlier about gene IDs and stuff. Uh, someone that is kind of like a mentor to me and is semi-local is Jimmy Cruz from Ball Life. Mm -hmm. I run a lot of stuff by him, man. He's even came down in one of my videos and helped me ID my first clutch. And uh, I just I run ideas by that guy. And uh, like how you were talking about how the community is and everything. You know, I, I run my prices kind of by him, my IDs, just kind of like a like a check, you know, like, hey, do you agree with this? Mm -hmm. And uh, that dude is a stand-up guy, so, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always cool when I can, my, I'm like stuck with stuff now because I'm doing a lot of like the asphalt and yellow belly complex stuff and it's and having like head clown and head pie in it. So I have a yellow belly head pie that looks like 
now that she can know it's almost like a mahogany almost just because like the influence but she has like a real crazy ring or two yeah so when i saw that i figured that man when i start having these asphalt heads coming out i'm gonna have trouble when they get mixed with like inchy and other things like that so usually i'll do like the same posts and it'd be like <laughs> the same tree of people i use to look at my stuff and i won't lead them up like, okay i'll mark them down and put them on white background and have them on different angles and tail shots too and if it's unanimous between everybody, okay, boom, that's what I thought. And then I'll market it as such because I'm a little bit more confident in those guys, too, because of their reputation. <coughs> too. Yeah. So uh, one of my main guys is uh, Billy from Mutation Creation. Shout out to the homie Billy. You know, I know he's going to watch it and stuff, too. And then um, that's when, you know, we've had each other on Instagram and stuff for a while. And we were on a podcast together. Was that last Two Mondays ago? Yeah, two weeks ago. It was it was well, the podcast number two. Podcast number two. So and, and I, I don't know if that was planned, but when Billy told me, I was like, hey, you know me and me and Antoine are almost neighbors, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it just worked out that way too. So um, you know, that uh link will be up right here right now, so I do that. Um so yeah, man, so so that that was fun. And um the cool thing about that, it got a lot of you know, people especially in Canada, like looking at my channel and your channel, I'm sure. I'm sure your followers and your subscribers kind of went up a little bit too. Yeah. I think off of that podcast, I got almost another like 50 subscribers or something like that just instantly too. So, you know, that was cool, man. And, then, and honestly too, I think like, I know he doesn't like me saying that. I said it before. Like, I think Billy is like the Joe Rogan of the like ball python world as far as like, changing the narrative on breeders helping each other out you know yeah. because you know um he has his mantra that i agree with too like it costs really nothing to help somebody else out yeah so even him just like liking a picture or him screenshotting something and putting on his wall and things like that too that little small gesture means a lot to people you know what i mean yeah. especially me coming from a lot of other public industries too like because being like in a mixed martial arts world you know like when I have like big name UFC fighters and stuff like that, you know, retweeting me wrapping somebody's hands or just something like that, or when I have seminars at the gym, that, that helps a lot, you know, and it's like validation too because when you have somebody vouching for you that's that high up in this industry and being held in such high regard, you know what I mean? Like that's to me, that's just validation of all the hard work that you're putting in, you know what I mean? So especially when it gets to the point where we start producing stuff and we post something and all of a sudden your phone rings and you got like the big four calling you. Hey man, put this aside for me. Here's the money. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that yeah. Too. And it, it, especially with the people that you buy stuff from, you know? So when they call like, it's like your, your grandkid breeding and stuff yeah. like that too. <laughs> so when you get stuff like that and you're getting that phone call and they're like, nah, it's mine. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And they're willing to pay more. <laughs> you know what? Just hold it. I give you, you know, an extra couple hundred bucks on top of that. Just, feed it and when shipping is good to go we take care of it you know so that's like you know that's like a big goal of mine to have you know people having me like that so which is always cool man so yeah and when you, and when you make a post of something like a clutch that you really like and like one of the big four that you call them you know like they like it and you're like wow yeah yeah, yeah, so. yeah that's a little validation when billy gives you the shout out somewhere or something mm -hmm. i mean it makes you know, let you know that you're doing something right you know yeah man it's just and like, I try to pay that forward mm -hmm. myself. Exactly. You know what I mean? Too, like, like, I'm constantly trying to do anything for anyone that, that needs help, always, yeah. and give shout outs. And but because usually I, I find that a lot of times that people that find me, my biggest base are people like inside of a year, inside of breeding or in a mm -hmm. hobby, stuff like that, too. So I spend hours answering texts and emails and Instagram messages throughout the day now that I figured out that there's another folder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yo, it yo, took me a while to figure bro, it out that out too. killed me for a long time. People were like, oh, I guess you don't just, I guess you're too big to answer. I'm like, no, I'm still, I didn't even know that, that that's what this was, you know? So after figuring that out, that helped a whole lot. So, um, I, I wake up an hour and a half earlier than I have to before I go to work just to answer social media, make my Instagram post, and take care of like YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, like just to interact with everyone. Well, some people figured out now, they went to my morph market and found my phone number, and now I just call you on that. And then I get text messages, and I can't really ignore phone calls like too much, you know, so I get that. And, and the thing about it is, man, I have no problem doing it because I'm still that guy to an extent, but not as much to a lot of other bigger guys, you know? So like, um, 
a lot of friends uh, like Jason Goodwin uh, from Goodies Exotics. Like uh, I got a I'm, snake from him. Yeah, man. I've actually bought stuff from him. He's bought stuff from me. And I hit him up about, you know, ID and stuff like that, too. And, like, he's killing it this year. And he killed it last year, too. And, you know, but and he's one of those guys, man. He's straightforward. He gives it to you, like, raw, uncut. Yeah. You won't sugarcoat anything, too. So, I like getting advice from him, man, because he's an OG in the game. So uh, I watched him, too, because his old lady does blackheads. And I'm yeah. a blackhead fan. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got my first blackhead a while back. It's a blackhead uh, head hypo. Yeah. So um, I'm doing some hypo blackhead projects and super dark stuff too, and I'm gonna put like GHI and black pastel in it stuff too. So I'm excited about that, man. Yeah. And um, I'm actually gonna like when I do my version of like like a Pompeii ish like clown project, I'm gonna have two different branches. Half of them instead of having the black pastel, and it'll be mahogany, and the other half would be uh, blackhead. So yeah, yeah, I never yeah. shared that publicly before. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so so we put that out there too. So yeah, so like um, I, I think I did mention that I think on the on the podcast. So and instead of having a yellow belly in there, it'd be asphalt. So yeah. it'd be all um, yeah. You did mention that because Billy like that. Man. Yeah, so it'd be like <laughs> clown, red stripe, spot nose, asphalt, mahogany, and black pastel, and we'll kind of see what comes out the best too. But uh, dude, this twenty twenty one season is gonna be crazy. Yeah. This season absolutely sucked for me, man. I was supposed to have like close to thirty clutches, I think, this year, and I think I'm only gonna have like eight. Or, and hopefully everyone's just going late, you know. That's a hoping. Like, you, like coming here and seeing a bunch of your stuff that still hasn't gone yet or whatever like that, too, that kind of gave me hope. Like, really, I was I was really stoked until I came here. And he was like, oh, I still got stuff I relate. And then this stuff is going yeah. there, you know. And people still have stuff tied up, too. So I'm going to just keep going at it, too, because I don't do ultrasound. I, I try to palpate. I fucking suck at that. <laughs> I tried and I couldn't get it. I was like, man, I'm yeah, tired like every time I take a big female and you know, because I got those like jujitsu strength hands, and sometimes I'm going too hard and I don't want to like push her butthole out while I'm going like that. I think that's what it is. I think probably I need to press harder, but yeah. I feel like, man, I'm squeezing her guts out. Yeah, you know, so, I do the paper towel and let her go yeah. in the tub like mm-hmm. they show on videos, but I'm like, I just... Yeah, I try that and I'm just like, a lot of times I'll do it and sometimes they'll start coming up and I've been bit in the face a couple times. <laughs> like, I guess I'm doing it too hard or something. <laughs> I don't know, man, but um, so this next couple of season, ultrasound will be a thing. and um, Definitely so, worth it. I yeah. mean, this is my first year. Yeah. Everyone pretty much knows that. But, man, it, like, I was able to see a girl that still gives me signs like she was building or, so, like, she does the bull wrapping mm-hmm. and the cool seeking. But according to the ultrasound, she's reabsorbing. Yeah. So uh, now I'm not even pairing her now. Yeah. So I'm saving that male yeah. just because the ultrasound, when I would be pairing her still because I'm thinking, oh, she's cool seeking and bull wrapping. No, <laughs> she's reabsorbing. And she's off food because yeah. she's reabsorbing, mm-hmm. not because she's right. building and far along. So... Yeah, it, it helps me learn how to breed better so far. I tried to try to validate whether I needed one. There's a couple of breeders I called, and I go, hey, man, um, how many females ahead do you think you should have when you figure out that you, like, invest in the ultrasound? And the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I was like, please tell me, like, okay, 75 for breeder females. And, no, I'll get one. So, I mean, just like with the rest of your equipment, that should be in the list of quality equipment, too. You got quality racks. You know, you got a quality rodent supply that, you know, you're getting rats from someone who isn't feeding their dog, you know, stuff, dog food or cat yeah. food or some crappy thing like that, you know. So, like, all my stuff on Missouri blocks or there's a couple other companies out there that have, like, their own, um, you know who Brian Floyd is near uh, Santa Clarita area? He has a really dope collection, but he breeds his own rats, too, and he has his own, like, uh, his own commercial brand that he makes himself yeah. of like rat food. Yeah, so I, I think I'm friends yeah. with him on Facebook. Yeah. yeah, he has like the red and white logo with the you yeah. you know what if you yeah, say yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, yeah, I was just looking at him and I was yeah. Like, yeah. So shout out to my man Brian. I used to get rats from him. Actually, um dude my rat supply source now is just like crazy. <laughs> so depending on my route and I'm traveling for fights and things like that, I have a guy if I'm coming back this way I can grab one from like, you no know, Fresno area, or if I'm coming back from Arizona, I got a rat guy. Yeah. So yeah, I just make sure I got a good source because that was a big issue. When I got out for a couple of years, when I opened up my gym, um, it was just, the pet stores were closing around me and they were giving me a really, really good deal on wholesale stuff. So, but now I got a guy 
in uh, Hesperia I drive to or Mojave, but now my Mojave guy just told me out the blue that he can just deliver to my house, so I'm never driving. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay the extra thirty bucks delivery fee, and I get such a good deal on them anyway, you know. So I'm gonna just do that, and then I just raise prices on the local guys. And <laughs> no, hey, that's business. <laughs> a couple of cents and stuff, man. You know. So yeah, I do mostly frozen thaws. So I I, I know. I'm not loyal to one particular mm -hmm. one, uh, but I, I do do a few live, and I, I already have talked to my wife about it. Eventually, because of the way we're going, like I'm already seeing that we're gonna have to add more freedom breeders and stuff. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I'm gonna have to breed my own rodents in order to make it cost effective. Yeah, and I'm damn, I don't want to. <laughs> but I mean, once I mean, I'm just looking ahead a couple years in the future. I'm like, I'm gonna have to in order to make it cost effective or. Mm -hmm limit my collection real small so yeah so i never i don't want to get to the point like i decided early on that you know with branding and marketing to being your own person like when i call a snake breeder like if i'm watching your youtube channels and i follow you on instagram and you're the face of your company if i'm calling your company about a snake and i can never talk to you yeah that means to me yeah, you could be doing great, but I, it still does give me a warm and fuzzy. Where if I got two guys that have the same stick and it's a couple of, like a couple hundred dollars apart, I'll spend the extra money on a guy that I know that the face of the guarantee behind and I can get a hold of them. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. I decided that I never want to get to the point where I have to have this like crazy fleet of employees going there because one, like we all work regular jobs before too, and. You know, unless let's be honest, when you're employed somewhere, your priority personally is to get a paycheck. You know, like no matter what we do with interviews, when you do an interview, you go, you know, uh, you know, why, how could you help our company? And you say some bullshit like, well, you know, uh, I could really use my skill set to be an asset to the company, and I think I can help your profit margins and blah blah. blah. Something they want to hear, yeah. but what you really really want to do is you want to get paid. So you hire employees. Their head, they're just you know getting up, cleaning like snake poop, and they're doing this, and then doing what they gotta do to get out of here. But no one takes care of your stuff better than you can. There's, nah. there's, there's no way, you know. There's a lot of, you know, I mean, you know the story about a lot of breeders who fire a, a lot of people who have a big turnaround because their facility was so big that they needed you know all these employees, and then they got to the point where they were doing so many other projects, and then the quality of the animals was slacking. They were having dead animals, stuff with mice and sick animals and things like that. But when you ask an employee, hey, how's the baby section going? Oh, everything's good. Everything's perfect. You're like, all right, move on with my life because now you don't have time to go look at that stuff. You know, So I don't ever want to get to that point where I'm not doing it every I can't look at my snakes every day like the weekends when I'm gone I come back I have everything set up before I leave like that Thursday fresh water you know spot cleaning but then when I come back you know I got work to do because it's been a couple of days but I'm confident that when I leave I left a great facility everything's labeled the right way everything's marked like I even have an exit strategy with my snakes like if somehow like I don't make it back home and I die I have like a <laughs> I have like a roster of people like my snakes are going to, and I keep records so well that when they get those snakes, they know, hey, it's been breeding, it's labeled the right way, and yeah, things like that. So, but yeah, no one takes care of your stuff better than you, man. So, I don't, I think I never want more than a hundred breeder females. Like that'll probably max me out right there. And to me, that's still too much. But at that point, you can start swapping stuff out and everything too. So at that point, I want like. At least seventy-five of those hundred females, all like visual, single, and double recessive stuff, and yeah. you know combos. So, what do you think is gonna be the max for you in here? Or I haven't really put a number on it yet, but I, you know, I'm training my two younger sons. You see them from mm -hmm. time to time in my videos, so they actually help me with all the stuff that they can reach. They they kind of maintain, but with my supervision, because like you said, like nobody does it like like we do, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, so you know, as long as they're around, you know. I'll probably fill up this room eventually, and I don't know. I look at it more like clutches. Like, all right, so how many clutches do I want to have? Mm -hmm. I think, well, maybe thirty to fifty would be a good range. I don't know. It's kind of like I have to go through it first, mm -hmm. though. I think you know, I'm one of those guys that will like shoot for the stars and uh, overwork myself, and then I'll back it off to a comfortable level. So I gave myself 
on like the wishful thinking end <laughs> for every breeder female I got, I figure I should have maybe 10 slots for them, <laughs> you yeah. know? So if you get to the point where you only have like two hatchling racks where you got like 24, like 24 racks, but you got 40, 40 girls going, where you gonna put them, yeah. you know? So just, you know, make sure like uh, a lot of people coming up did skip out on the equipment early, you know what I mean? And like, you did it right, like <laughs> you know, you make sure you got quality stuff, and then you move the stuff out and swap it around too, because you know we all started like the melamine racks first mm -hmm. and stuff like that too, because you didn't have to wait a uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten week, three month turnaround for a lot of big companies. So you can go down to Palmdale to Ridge Racks, he can get you one done in a couple of weeks. Boom, have it. Oh, you can have it done in up. a couple of days, yeah, man. Especially big shout you, out to Red's Racks. Yeah, you need Red racks, racks right now, man, and he, he gets it. And they're good, man, too, but, I mean, it gets to the point where they're just so heavy and take, it has, like, a really big footprint in your facility. So, but eventually, you're going to switch over to PVC for, like, your hatchling stuff, and then you're going to go yeah. to, like, your bigger ARS or Freedom Breeder, too, so. Yeah, um, like, just like what you're saying. So, like, I seen the amount of eggs that my girls were dropping, which was more than I estimated. So, before I get any more clutches on the ground, I set up some more half swing racks. Like, I got to stay ahead of it. I don't want to have more snakes than I have space. So. And these were sea serpents, right? Yeah, how, sea serpents. How fast will it turn around on that? Normally, like these other ones, he'll have them from Florida to here within 10 days of the order. But mm -hmm. there was a heat tape shortage where he couldn't find heat tape anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, there was a supplier concern. So, this took like four weeks, five weeks. That's still not bad. There's but that was still shorter than some of the other PVC suppliers that were around. So, I got mine from a company. I ordered it in December and didn't get it till almost April. Yes. Yeah. Until, until I threatened to do a PayPal to speak on them. Then it finally showed up. Yeah. I'm like, this is crazy. So. You know, I'm not going out of them yet because I heard there were some other issues going on and stuff like that too. So, I mean, but I'm going to go with Sea Service. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and yeah. Chris from Sea Service is a top notch guy, man. I, uh, just a quick little story. I ran into him down in Anaheim at the uh, Super Show when they had it down in Anaheim. And I bought another rack off him when I was there. And as soon as he seen my name, he was like, Oh, you ordered such and such rack uh, seven months ago. Like, that's how involved he is with this that's company. That's crazy. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm like, oh, wow. He's only seen my name come across the website. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, that's you. You ordered this. I was like, wow, that's a cool guy, man. Yeah, that's that's crazy when you at the point where you be so intimate with your customers and stuff, too. And uh, and and honestly, that was the whole motivation behind, uh, especially during the quarantine with no reptile shows going on and nothing to do, me starting a YouTube channel mm -hmm. because... Like outside of this industry and this hobby, I talked to so many other people about like building their brand and things like that. So like I manage a lot of <clears throat> I manage a lot of MMA fighters. I manage a lot of like Instagram models and stuff and help them get sponsors and kind of do all like kind of work for them that way. And them putting their faces out there, that's the way you get business, you get results, you you know what I mean? You get fights, things like that too. So a lot of fight promoters uh, that I work with as like the matchmaker and fight the cut man and stuff. I was always gave them crap about not having their face out there because I'm like, dude, you have this stigma about you that you're an a hole. You know, every time I bring up who I work for, they're like, oh, that guy, nah, hell no, I'm not putting my guys in that car. He's a jerk. I'm like, have you dealt with him personally? No, but I just heard. So you're going off a second and third hand what you heard about this guy. So you don't know the guy personally. No, I don't even know what he looked like. So I'm like, that's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. I got on him about that. So we started doing like vlogs and Facebook live stuff and putting his face out there and that helped out a lot. And then he hit me with the, hey man, you should maybe do the same thing. <laughs> do, do, do the same thing, you know? Because what's crazy about me is I, I've been around for a while and like I, I do great on snake sales and what was crazy when my YouTube channel started, people go, hey man, I didn't even know you were black. <laughs> I was like, seriously? <laughs> What? Like, yeah, I didn't even, like, that's crazy. Like, I did not, like, if you put a million dollars in my head and, you know, interacting with you through email and stuff like that, if I, if, if I just said, if they said you're a black guy, I'd be like, there's no way, you know? <laughs> so, which is, which is crazy to me, so. So, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just fortunate. That's the one thing the quarantine did do for me was, um, it helped me reflect on that and develop a new skill because like I do all the editing myself and everything too mm -hmm. and, and I never edited a video in my life until March you know yeah so 
it's always a good skill to have, and that kind of helps me out with the overhead too, because I'm not paying somebody to do it. I sat down, and now I'm learning Photoshop, so my thumbnails would be better coming up and stuff too. Instead of using like some of the apps, I'm gonna just use Photoshop, and I can put exactly what I want where I want instead of having to settle for what an app does for me. You know? So. Yeah, that's something I I did too. Was uh, like right before I cut my first clutch, I was like, I need to step up my thumbnail game. I talked to Miguel and he's like, hey, uh, I got this guy who does mine, you know, and it's like, you know, 10 bucks a thumbnail. Mm -hmm. And then I go check on Photoshop and I'm like, well, for 10 bucks a month, I could do it myself because I'm mm -hmm. going to be dropping eight episodes a month. That's yep. 80 bucks. So, of course, my thumbnails aren't as good as his and that guy that creates them. But I would much rather learn to do it myself from the ground up. And uh, that way I have control of everything. And, and it'll get better, too. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I learned a little bit right. of something and with everyone yep. and... My biggest anxiety about doing the videos was like how much they were gonna suck. Yeah. Every YouTuber out there, when they first start, most cases, their videos suck. Go back to some of the favorite, your favorite YouTubers. Like I was saying about like the like some of the big three, especially like PewDiePie, like all of his gaming videos and how long it took him to get his subscribers and stuff too. So if you at least 1% better every video. You're improving on something. Like, you know, the quality will get there, the subscribers will come. But at the same time, your first priority in our industry is not YouTube, it's the quality of these animals. Yeah. So when you're producing quality animals and stuff that no one else has and something people wants to see, they'll come to your channel. So you have to have that balance of your thumbnails, your HD quality videos, your lighting, the content you're putting out, but the quality animals too, you know. And nice setups because the cool thing about the professional setups is that they're also aesthetically pleasing too oh, you know? <laughs> yeah 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 mentally i like it you yeah. know what i mean that and things match things line mm -hmm. up and uh yeah i mean you're on point with everything too that's kind of how i built to where i am you know getting quality animals from quality breeders you know uh and then YouTube, like I work on getting comfortable in front of the camera in the first like month or so. Mm -hmm. And then it's like work on editing a little bit, then lighting, and then kind of just go in a circle and then thumbnails. And then, you know, I improved on lighting again. And it's always a, a thing, but just uh, it's a, for me, it's hard to not overwhelm myself yeah. with one thing like, oh, I want like the badass thumbnails like right now. Like, no, just. Take a chill pill. Yeah. I started learning less is more with thumbnails because by the time I do all this intricate stuff on some of them, and then when you see it on a thumbnail, it's literally the size yeah. of your thumbnail. I'm like, I yep. can't even see all this stuff, man. All right, let's do a less is more. It was like, man, like a lot of people don't like the, uh, they said the puzzle clown sucked. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, wasn't, I wasn't too big on that. And then I seen a, a hypo sunset. I didn't really, me personally, I didn't like it. So I, I know not to go hypo sunset myself. Yeah, but I think I think there's a go sunset is a good project because it yeah. makes it brighter. Because a lot of times they dull out, and then uh, I'm one of those people that think Inchi makes everything better. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted I'm that guy like Inchi just put Inchi sunsets and then make them desert ghost and then slap some other stuff in there. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, so G Strike Cloud. Yeah, I got, I got one of those long-term projects coming up, too. Um, I got that clutch where they, well, I got the male and female where they're both possible at hypo. Mm -hmm. So, but since the male, I can prove them out first. So, I got some uh, single gene, like, hypo stuff coming for a couple of my males. It's like 50% at hypo or 66%. Yeah. That was part of the project, but it wasn't the main focus. But I know that if I don't prove them out, like this next coming up season, I'm not really worried about hitting the triple recessive with that. So, yeah, because if I can hit hypo G strike clowns, I mean, you know, we going to Sizzler, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know. So, but. yeah, I'm, I'm also uh, I'm messing around with disco, and uh, I'm liking what I'm seeing there. So I, I plan on pushing that into some more projects as I go to, and I have males that hopefully. We'll be ready next season to put them to some of these females I already have that are breeder size. So I think, uh, yeah, yeah, bringing disco back, baby. Nice. <laughs> so in the grand scheme of things, okay. So let's say fast forward five years. Where do you want to be five years in this game? You know, I think about that a lot, honestly, and I try not to uh, set too many expectations. So like, I have a general idea where you know. I want to be 
I want my projects more refined at that point. I want all my breeders pretty much being visuals or a visual and a head at that point. Be pushing around the 50 clutch range. So my whole, my the way just my brain works though is like, so I look at like recessives and codons. So like I look at the recessives as like the cake, you know what I mean? Like you have a chocolate cake or you have a spice cake or whatever and your codons are kind of like the icing on the mm -hmm. cake. So I plan on just pursuing certain recessives and mixing the codons that I like in with that and just kind of got to be ready to pivot and, and change at any point though too. Mm -hmm. Stay fluid. Be water, just like Bruce Lee said, yeah. you know? Just be water. The coolest thing is when you produce, when you hatch out a female and then you grow her up and then you get eggs off of the female that you produce, man, it's just so gratifying. You're like, yes, you know, it's exactly what you want. You know where it came from. You know the genetics for the most part because it's, it's your thing, you know what I mean? And you've learned all the little quirks about the ball pythons because the ball pythons aren't the easiest animals to deal with. So, you know, they are, but they aren't. They're, they're, yeah. they're finicky. And <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, you especially coming from like, a lot of times when I buy stuff from other, like from other breeders, whatever, I take into account where the humidity is at in their area, like their altitude, you know, a lot of people are below sea level and things like that. So if I can get stuff like closer than I want, I, I tend to deal with that because they're used to dealing with almost like the desert humidity. So if I get stuff from Rosemead or Palmdale or Bakersfield and anywhere like that mm -hmm. in LA, I tend to gravitate towards that. And then, but when I get stuff from like the East Coast and you know, stuff like from the Carolinas and Florida and Georgia, a lot of times I know that I may come to some problems with them being finicky, so I'll have to like adjust accordingly. So, yeah, you know, that stuff a lot of people don't think about too because, uh, like even when I flew out here a couple of years ago uh, for a job, the altitude between where I live at and here made me sick. So <laughs> I got altitude sickness because I was living right by the water below sea level and I get no at now, 2,300 feet. And that same day I was like, man, what's, what's wrong with me? And I just didn't feel well, I was out of, out of breath and things like that too. So you don't know how that affects the animals either. So that's just a big getting used to period. So when they're traveling through different time zones like that, I take a little bit longer for them. I, I put them in their setup. I do my quarantine stuff. Let them settle before I even bother handling them and stuff like that. And they just chill, let them hang out, get them acclimated for a lot longer than everybody else. So that's a big tip uh, that helped me out in the long run. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, man. So I appreciate you uh, letting me out, having me come out. Next time I'm going to be picking up some animals from you. <laughs> that's yeah. usually a, that's usually a tradition of mine when I come visit. I usually buy stuff for people yeah. too. Yeah. So um, I'll rock the shirt in the next video. I'll make sure all your stuff is in the description down below, man. I appreciate you, brother. Uh, yeah, good having you.